I would like, if you would, please, to turn to Joel chapter 2 to start the sermon. And as a background to Joel, I'm sure that's one of your favorite books to turn to, Joel. The book of Joel, there was a terrible plague in verse 1 that went through of locusts that went through the land and devastated the land. And it was a severe plague plague of locusts that went through and ate everything and it was just devastated the land and normally when we read Joel 2 we read it as a prophecy of something coming into the future for us but I want you to read this as we read this I want you to think of it the people were going through this at the time and it was meant for these people for what they were going through at the time. Normally, we, or a lot of times we read this as thinking of it as a future event, and the prophecy is dual, but, but these people were experiencing this as it was happening and didn't think of this as, as something way in the future. This was meant for them at the time. So Joel chapter 2, verse 1. The prophet Joel says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. And again, we read that as a prophecy for the future, and it will happen again, but they're experiencing this as it's being told. A day of darkness and gloominess, a cloud, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. And as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall it be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devours before them and behind them a flame burns. The land is as a garden of Eden before them. And behind them a desolate wilderness, yes, and nothing shall escape them. They're talking about the locusts are coming in and just devouring the land totally, absolutely everything. And in verse 12, it goes on to say, Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. And they were used to doing that. That was common to their time to have fasting and weeping and mourning. But in verse 13, the prophet Joel tells them to do something that they were not used to and they had not heard before. In verse 13, he says, And rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. For who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priest, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thy heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Therefore they, sh they say among thy people, where is thy God? That's what the prophet Joel was saying to the people of their time when a calamity hit. Now there was a man who was very, very active in his church and he was talking with a friend named Mike. Now Mike was a Sabbath keeper and he called, who has called him on the phone. Now they hadn't spoken 
for some time, and suddenly the young man blurts out, Where is God, Mike? Where is the God that we sing about and pray to all the time? Kind of took him by shock. And then he revealed why he senses God's absence. He was broke. He hadn't eaten a complete meal in over two weeks. He was behind on his rent. His water and electricity had been disconnected. And on top of that, he didn't have any money to fill his prescription, and he was bipolar. Now, Mike listened with compassion, but he too wondered, where is God for his friend? You know, he knows his friend is a committed Christian. In fact, this friend was instrumental in getting him in church. In fact, he was the one who told him about the Sabbath and got him to actually go to church. And now he's listening to his friend's problems and he begins to wonder, why does God seem to forget about some of the best, most devoted people? And why do they have to struggle so much? You know, the prophet Joel that we just read about in chapter 2 wondered the same thing. They were going through a calamity at the time. Disaster had come upon the people of Israel in the plague of locusts. A swarm of locusts had invaded their land. It stripped their land of all the vegetation, everything. Their crops were dev devastated. The food was scarce. There was almost no food at all. The animals were suffering. The people of the land were right on the edge of starvation. And then Joel attributes these adversities directly to God. But he's convinced that God is a righteous and loving God. So Joel is convinced that the problem has to be Israel's sin. So Joel instructs the people to blow the trumpet, sound the alarm, that the day of the Lord's judgment is at hand, a day of dark and gloom. And Joel wrote something the people had not heard before. He said, rend your heart, not your garments. Blow the trumpet in Zion and declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Let them say, spare your people, Lord. Don't make an inheritance an object of scorn you know, a, a byword among the nations. Why should the people around the other nations say, where is their God? Why should they make fun of them, saying, oh, your God has left you? You know, this was a call for Israel to be truly repentant before the Lord in order to gain God's favor. It was very, very common in the Old Testament, over and over and over again, for the people to rip their clothing it was a sign of mourning to them. To go into fasting and prayer with sackcloth, they would take ashes and throw the ashes up in the air, put ashes upon their clothing to show penitence for sin. And Joel came to him and said, that's not enough. Just by you putting on a show in front of God it doesn't really mean anything for you to do that. True repentance comes from a changed heart. And so he wrote to them, rend your heart, not your garments, not your clothes. But you know what? We live in a different time. We don't sacrifice animals to show God we've changed. We don't burn things and take the ashes and smear on our faces. We don't take the ashes and throw them up in the air and get underneath the ashes to show God we've changed. 
but we also hopefully don't believe like what the Israelites did. The Bible showed us an example where the nation was going the wrong direction. And God showed them that the nation was going the wrong direction. And he punished the nation. And unfortunately, we sometimes think any time something happens to us bad, God is punishing us. No matter what, if something bad happens to us, we say, oh, God's punishing us. Now, you know, here's a, here's a case in the Bible. God punished the nation. Look what he did to them. So something happens to us that's not good. Well, obviously, God's punishing us. I have an example in the Bible right here in Joel to prove to me if something bad happened to me, God is punishing us. But that's not always the case. You know, there was a story about a minister who was driving down the street. He was late to come to church, so obviously he was driving a little bit too fast. Looks up in the mirror, there's the red lights blaring behind him. He pulls over, policeman walks up to him, says, driving a little bit too fast. The minister looks at him and he says, you know, the Bible says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Policeman has his pad out, just keeps right on writing, doesn't say a word. Finally, he pulls off the ticket, hands it to the minister, and he says, you know, pastor, the Bible also says, go thou and sin no more. <laughs> We're all sinners. We're all sinners to one degree or the other. And somehow we've got into the idea, unfortunately, that every time something bad happens to us, oh, that's God. Because we see examples, what I just read in Joel. God did punish them. And we've stuck things like that into our brain that no matter what happens, well, that was God. You know, I've talked to people and they went to the doctor and they were diagnosed with cancer. And all of a sudden they said, oh, what did I do wrong? God is punishing me because I contracted cancer. I've talked to people that lost their job. And unfortunately, the first thing they said was, God's angry at me. I lost my job. Sometimes it was the company went under. They didn't just lose their job, the whole company went under. And they said, God's mad at me. Our whole company lost, every single one of us lost our job. The company went under. And their view was, God's mad at me. I lost my job. We all lost our jobs. And they really believed that God closed the entire company, that all these people lost their jobs because God was mad at this one person. And everyone lost their job because God was going to punish this one person. And they believed it. I didn't get married until I was almost 29 years old. I wanted to get married before that, but I couldn't find the right person. And for a long time, I believed God was punishing me. And I was wrong. God finally brought me the right person, but God wasn't punishing me before that. The right person moved into Kansas City God waited, didn't want me to get married until the right person moved into Kansas City. And then he went, that's the person I want you to marry. He didn't want me to marry somebody else. That person moved into Kansas City and he said, that's the person I want you to marry. And we've been very happily married for 30 some odd years now. God wasn't punishing me 
before that time, but I believed God was punishing me because I couldn't find a mate until I was almost 29 years old. And I believed it, and I've talked to other single men right now that believe God is punishing them because they can't find a mate. And I'm sure there's women that feel the same way right now, that God is punishing them because they can't find a mate. I've talked to numerous people that have health problems and they truly believe God is punishing them because they have health problems. They believe they've committed some sin and they've prayed to God to show them the sin they have committed. And God won't show them the sin they have committed. And they believe they are being punished because they have a health problem. And God won't show them the sin they have committed. And it's so sad that they believe that for years and years and years. Would you turn with me to Psalm 103? If there's any doubt in your mind, any doubt in your mind, Psalm 103 spells it out for us. Psalm 103, starting in verse 10. Psalm 103, verse 10. He says, He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And yet I've talked to people that believe they're being punished for their sins. And I said, did you ask God for forgiveness? Oh, yes. Really? You asked God to be forgiven? Yes. Do you believe God forgives your sins? Yes. But you believe God is still punishing you? Well, yes, I'm still sick. You don't believe that he removes your sins as far as the east is from the west. You don't believe the word of God. You truly ask God for forgiveness. Truly ask God for forgiveness. Yes. You are truly repentant. Yes. The scripture is plain as can be. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Now, do we suffer sometimes for making unwise choices? Oh, yes. <laughs> we absolutely do. The story I told about Mike, the young man was broke and couldn't pay his bills. Why? Well, I don't know exactly why he did that. Maybe it was because he spent his money unwisely. Maybe he had a gambling problem. Maybe he had a drug problem. I don't know. Maybe he had a good intentions. Maybe he invested in something very unwisely and lost all of his money is why he does. You know, I don't know. It said he was bipolar. You know, maybe he didn't go to a good doctor. Maybe he went to a bad doctor. And maybe he lost, you know, everything doing that. I don't know. Maybe he made bad choices and lost all of his money. That's not God's fault. That's not God punishing him if he made bad choices doing that. And maybe he did other things that weren't his fault. That's not God punishing him for something. He can't blame God for that on something. You know, I want you to think now about Bible examples that happened in the Bible that we can go back to. What about Peter? What about B Peter? When he denied Christ before Christ was crucified, Jesus came up to him and said, you're going to deny me, not once, not twice, but three times. And Peter said, oh, no, no, I'm not. And then what did Peter do? 
He denied him three times after Christ warned him. And then in the resurrection, Peter was really, really sorry that he had done it, but he was even warned that he was going to do that. And Peter still denied him three times. So when Jesus was resurrected and came back and saw Peter, did Jesus come up to him and say, told you so, told you you were going to do it, now you're going to pay for it? No. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus didn't treat him that way. Did Jesus punish him for doing that? No. Jesus didn't punish him. He had every right to punish him for doing that, but Jesus didn't do it that way. You know, what about the ten lepers, lepers that Jesus cleansed and only one came back to thank him? What would you have done? When one of them came back to thank him, I would have said, oh, the other nine? Here you go. We'll just give you leprosy again. Maybe then you'll come back and thank me, huh? Maybe I'll get you back that way. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus had every right to do that. He didn't treat them that way. You know, that would have been, that would have taught them a lesson. He didn't, he didn't do that to them. He didn't do that at all. He didn't treat them that way at all. You know, what about the Lord's Prayer? You know, that we come on there and it said, you know, to ask for forgiveness on there. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do you really believe if you forgive your debtors that God is not going to forgive you? Now, he does tell you you have to forgive your debtors. Well, if you forgave your debtors, do you believe God's not going to forgive you? And yet you harbor things and think God's is still punishing you? You really think that's going to happen? That God's not going to forgive you? That, that would be silly. What about Thomas that doubted Christ, Thomas the doubter. And Jesus showed up and, and he said, Thomas, come here. Feel my hands. Feel the holes in my hands. Come here, feel my side. You know, Jesus had every right to say, get out of here, Thomas. All these other disciples, believe me, you're the only one. You're a doubter. I don't want you near me. Jesus didn't treat him that way. Jesus says, come here, feel my side. He was a doubter. Jesus, did, Jesus didn't treat him that way at all. Jesus gave him every chance to come and do it that way. What about Peter? When Christ met him, was walking on the water, and Peter said, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come out on the water. And Peter started walking on the water. And then his faith failed him, and he started sinking. And Jesus reached out and grabbed him. If I wanted to teach Peter a lesson, I'd say, let's let him sink for a while. Let's let him get a little wet. Then I'll pull him out. Would that teach him faith? Jesus didn't do that. Jesus didn't punish people. That's not the way Jesus teaches. Do you think Jesus could have let his head go underwater just a little bit and say, now do you have faith? Now let me pull you up. Jesus doesn't do that. That's not the way he teaches that way when they do that. You know, the, but I think the biggest, biggest thing they could do to teach that way, the one that, that I hadn't thought of about before that amazes me the most is when Jesus was on the cross. He's an unbelievable pain, unbelievable agony, more than we could even imagine. He hasn't done a single thing wrong. It's unbelievable what he's going through. He's, he's on the cross, and what comes to his mind? He turns to the Father, and he says, Father, forgive all these people because they don't know what they have done. Now, he forgave all of these people. They didn't ask for forgiveness. Do you realize all those people, they deserve something bad, but you know the sin was not given to them. 
Do you think God's going to say, oh, sorry, Jesus. Sorry, the sin they just committed was too horrible. Sorry. God the Father had to forgive all those people that did those horrible, horrible things to Jesus. They're all forgiven. All those people that crucified Jesus, all those people that lied about him, all those people that whipped him, that did those horrible, horrible things, those Romans, those people that did all those things to Jesus, Jesus said, I want them all forgiven. God the Father had to say, oh, he had to agree with Jesus. He said, forgive them, Father. Do you think the Father's going to say no? All those sins were forgiven while he was there being crucified. It's unbelievable. And they didn't even ask for forgiveness. And Jesus forgave all those sins. Wow. I mean, that's... You don't even ask to be forgiven, and he did. Ron Lee Davis, in a book called Courage to Begin, tells about a man who needed a new start. His name is Robert Robinson. He notes that it was a bright Sunday morning in 18th century London. However, Robert, Robert Robinson's mood was not sunny. While the other people were hurrying off to church, the sound of church bells only reminded him of a time long ago when he had vibrant faith. He had once loved God a lot, but he had wandered far, far away. His heart once burned with so much passion for God and the things of God, but now he said it only had cold embers for church and for God. I've known a lot of people like that. Lost in his lonely thoughts, Robinson suddenly became aware of a courage of a carriage coming up behind him. It was a horse-drawn cab. He started to lift his hand to hail the driver, but he noticed the cab was already occupied by a young woman, obviously dressed for church. He waved the driver on, but the young woman ordered the driver to stop. She offered to share the carriage with him. Are you going to church, she asked. And after a long pause, Robinson said, yes. And so he stepped into the carriage and he sat down by the young woman. As the carriage headed toward the church, Robert Robinson and the young woman exchanged introductions. When he stated his name, she seemed to recognize his name. She withdrew a small book of inspirational verse from her purse. That's a coincidence, she said. I was just reading a verse by a poet named Robert Robinson. And she looked at him and she said, could that possibly be you? And when Robert saw the poem she was referring to, he admitted that he had written this poem a long, long time ago. Oh, my, how wonderful, she exclaimed. Imagine I'm sharing a cab with the author of these very lines. Well, Robert Robinson barely heard her. He was so absorbed in the words of the poem that he had once written. Later, they would be set to music. In fact, these became a great hymn. In fact, we're going to sing this hymn right after this. The words of Robert Robinson's poem go like this. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. And then his eyes slipped to the bottom of the page where he read the words that struck his heart with conviction. Prone to wander, Lord. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for the courts above. Well, he could barely read those last few lines through the tears that filled his eyes. And he said, yeah, I wrote those words and I've lived those words, prone to wander, prone to leave the God I love. Well, the young woman suddenly understood and she said, you know, you also wrote, take my heart. Here's my heart, O Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. You know, you can offer your heart again, Mr. Robinson. She said, it's not too late. And it wasn't 
too late for Mr. Robinson. The author, Ron Lee Davis, said that at that very moment, he turned his heart back to God because of what this woman said in the carriage. And you know, according to this author, for the rest of his days, he turned his heart back to God and he went back to church and had a relationship with God for the rest of his life, starting in that carriage with that woman. Now, you know, I know when we make wrong choices, we pay a price. Life teaches us that. We all know that. And the question is why people suffer? I don't know. I don't have the answer to why people suffer. I do know God chastises those he loves, but God doesn't sit there waiting to punish us. I know that for a fact. God doesn't work that way. I do know God loves us. I do know God forgives us. I am absolutely sure of that. The examples in the Bible, when God does the things like this, God uses it to bring his people back to him. He doesn't punish people to drive them away. He uses it to bring them back to him. Always when he does that. Now, I don't know what your need is today. Maybe, maybe you don't feel forgiven. Maybe you don't feel as close to God as, as what you used to. I've gone through periods like that in my life. Maybe you don't pray like you used to. Maybe you wonder where God is. I've been there. Today could be a turning point in your life, a turning point back to God. It could be today for you. Or maybe the reason you're here today is that you already feel close to God. Maybe this could be a boost to your faith that you already have. Maybe, maybe you're here in this congregation today because you're here to help somebody else that needs that help today. Maybe you're the boost to help that person get close to God. That woman in that carriage brought that other man back to God that day. And maybe that's why you're here today, to bring somebody else close back to God. Everybody is needed. Whatever it means for you, the prophet Joel was right about one thing. God is a righteous and loving God, and God is faithful to his promises. That means for those of us who are on this side of the resurrection of Jesus, if we ask, God is faithful and just. We know God will forgive our sins and remember them no more. That's a promise. That's a promise of God. If we seek a closer walk with him, he's going to give us that closer walk with him. That's a promise of God. None of us can go back and make a brand new start. But with Jesus Christ, from now on, we can make a brand new ending starting today. And my friends, that's the good news. Thank you.